are in listen-only mode. Hello, welcome. My name is Andrika. Thank you for joining us today. We're glad you could be with us and also very glad that you're interested in hydroponics and thinking about how you can get those into your lunch program. Again, my name is Andrika Cooley. I am a middle school teacher at Palouse Prairie School. I teach science and am the teacher behind um, the kids and their project today, which is putting this webinar together for you today. Another person who is behind the scenes, and you'll hear her voice later today, is Colette DePhelps. She works, um, she's a, the director of our wellness committee at our school and has done a lot of work first to facilitate this webinar. And she also works with the University of Idaho and a local organization in our community called Rural Roots, who have both provided support for us today. Before we get started, I just want to emphasize a couple of things that you can do to improve your experience with, with us this webinar. First of all, take some time to close all other programs running on your computer. If you end up having problems with sound, switch to the phone and then mute your computer. There will be a number you can call and just listen on your phone. If throughout the webinar you have any questions, just go ahead and type them in the questions box. Before I turn it over to the kids, I do want to just give you a little bit of information about us, Palouse Prairie School. We're located in Moscow, Idaho. It's a fairly rural um, community in the uh, northwestern part of Idaho State. We're a public charter school, which is a K through 8 school. We have a, an integrated middle school. And we have about 170 students um, at our school. We fairly accurately reflect our community, which is relatively diverse. We have the University of Idaho located in our in Washington State University, just eight miles away. About 32% of our student population is um, on free or reduced lunches. And uh, the community where we live has a lot of agriculture and um, a lot of farming, mostly dry land farming, wheat, lentils, garbanzo beans, and then also a fairly active um, small producer community as well. Our school um, follows the uh, expeditionary learning model, EL Education. So we're part of the expeditionary learning network. So our school really focuses on project-based learning. We have um, most of our learning takes place in in in-depth units of study, which are typically last about eight to twelve weeks, and uh, then we we have a culminating project. And in fact, the webinar that we've prepared for you today is our culminating project, our final product. For this study, our our, our in-depth study, we call it an expedition. We've we've started with a guiding question to lead our learning. And that question is, how do we feed ourselves in the world now and into the future? We've done two different case studies to help us get at the content to be able to prepare and understand what we're sharing with you today. Our first case study was uh, looking at answering the question, what is the omnivore's dilemma? And then in terms of science, really digging into the question of what do plants need? Before I pass it off, we've got a quick poll for you. We want to find out about more about you and wonder where do you live? This is Colette and I'm launching your polls today. On this first poll, if you could just select which region you live in, that would be great. So about 57%, 75% of our audience has voted. I'm just going to give it a little bit more time so everyone has an opportunity to vote. 83%. Okay, one last chance to vote before I close the poll. Okay, I'm closing the poll and sharing the results. So, about 64% of our audience is from the western U.S., 14% from the southern U.S., and 18% from the eastern U.S., 5% from the Midwest, and we didn't have anyone select the other. So thank you. And we have a next poll. that is about your interest in the webinar today. So
So are you interested in the webinar because you're an educator, a grower, a producer, lunch program staff, a friend of Palouse Prairie School, or perhaps another reason? For this poll, you can check all that apply. Half of our audience has already voted. It's really fun for us on our side with all the students to see why you're on today. It helps ground our presentation. So thank you for voting. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. 38% of the people on our webinar today are educators. 33% are growers or producers. 17% lunch program staff. 21% are friends of Palouse Prairie School and 42% identified they also have another role. Okay, so I'm going to return to the webinar and have our next speaker. Hello, my name is Riley and I'll be starting us off today. We're the Plus Prairie Charter School 7th grade class and we're looking forward to presenting to you today. So our purpose is to tell people how to assemble and use the hydroponic system to share how we get the lettuce into our school lunchroom to help people improve school lunches and to inspire people to eat healthier. Here are the sections that we've divided the webinar into. First we will explain what all went into the hydroponic system to get us to this point. Then we will tell you the cost of the hydroponic system as well as the materials needed and how to assemble the system. After that, we will tell you what to grow, what we grow and how to grow and the care and maintenance that goes into the system. Then we will show you how we prepare the lettuce and get it into our lunches. After that, we will tell you the benefits we have noticed of having a school hydroponic system in our school. And finally, we will conclude our presentation with a brief recap and Q&A. Now I'll be turning it over to Kaya for some information on what all went into the project to get us to this point, but first we have a quick poll. Thank you. So our next poll is, are you familiar with hydroponics? So give couple of seconds for our audience to complete the poll. Our responses are yes, no, and somewhere in between. So I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So 42% of our audience say yes, they're familiar with hydroponics. 8% say no, and 50% somewhere in between. Thank you. Thank you for participating in our poll. My name is Kaya Dibdahl, and I'm going to present some background information into how we became interested in hydroponics and how it has worked out for us. So what is hydroponics? Hydroponics is simply growing produce without the use of soil. This is achieved by using water with added nutrients along with natural or artificial light. Hydroponics differs from aquaponics because there is not an aquaculture ecosystem where you recycle the water and nutrients from your reservoir in order to feed fish. What is the Kratky method? The Kratky method is a method of hydroponics we use. With normal hydroponics, you need to oxygenate the water so that the plant can breathe. You use a lot of electricity, and there are always pumps running. Overall, this is very expensive. But with the Kratky method, you don't need any of this equipment. It's practically the most hands-off method of farming possible. The way it works is that there is an airspace between the lid of the container and the water so that the root can breathe and the plant gets the oxygen it needs to respire. We had always wanted a farm to school program to get more fresh food and awareness of fresh food into our school. We tried a few different things over the years, including a greenhouse, but they'd all fallen through. 
especially because our climate is such that during many of the school months that we would want lettuce, it would not be available. Then we came up with the idea of hydroponics because it would allow us to grow indoors. We wrote a grant so that we could get the money we needed to build a system, and hydroponics has worked wonderfully for getting lettuce into our lunch program. Farm to School is a program run state, district, or school-wide. It works to get fresh local produce into school lunches. The reason you should build a hydroponic system is that it is easy to use and maintain, so you don't have to change your reservoir or nutrients very often. Hydroponics has a positive impact on students' eating habits because it creates a tendency to have a little salad with their meals. A farm to school program allows students to eat sustainably grown, healthy food. Having students grow and harvest their own food can lead to more enthusiasm around healthy foods. Hydroponics and food can be incorporated into a class or science project. Last year, the then 7th and 8th graders read The Omnivore's Dilemma. Like I've already said, we always wanted a farm to school program, but we'd never known how to do it. After reading Omnivore's Dilemma, they became even more interested in being able to grow healthy food for our whole school, year-round. After doing a little bit of research, they came up with hydroponics. Once they'd gotten the grant money to start, they built a system from scratch. Hydroponics also allows you to grow produce year-round. Being inside a warm environment it produces healthy food at times of the year that you wouldn't normally have access to it. Now I will hand it off to Joseph and Jordan, who will be explaining how we built our system. Hi, my name is Joseph. Jordan and I will be talking today about how we designed and built our hydroponic system. First, we had to analyze the school building while keeping in mind that we had that we needed a space that had the correct temperature and easy access to electricity. The expert that we had teachers had told us that we had to use artificial lights to give the plants enough light. We designed the system based on the space we had and some of the materials that we had on hand. We had some we had shelves that no one was using, so we utilized those and we had a few fluorescent glow lights. We then had to purchase more lights, ten gallon tubs and one and one fourth inch outside diameter PVC pipe. Our overall cost was under nine hundred dollars. The tubs we bought were clear and they would have allowed light to get through resulting in the growth of algae. So to counter that, we spray we spray painted them black. I, and I'm now going to turn it over to Jordan to talk about how we assembled the rest of the system. Hi, my name is Jordan, and I'll finish telling you about how we built our system. The tubs came with tight-fitting lids, so we had to drill holes into the lids to hold the plants. We had to buy one inch inside diameter PVC pipe with an outside diameter of one and a quarter inch. So we drilled a slightly larger hole of one and three eighths of an inch to hold the pipes. We drilled eight holes on each lid to make sure that they were evenly spaced. We cut each pipe into two inch lengths. We put rubber bands on the PVC pipe to ensure that the pipe did not fall through the lid. To keep the actual plant inside the PVC pipe, we had to wrap the bottom of the pipe with burlap netting to secure it with a rubber band. For the lights, we used four foot long fluorescent lights, which are hung by adjustable chains. The lights need to, need to hang two to three inches above the plant. Fluorescent bulbs are, are more, more efficient, energy efficient than normal bulbs, meaning that they require less energy to provide the same amount of light. This energy efficiency can lead to lower electric bills. LED lights are even more energy efficient, but we aren't using those yet. 
And now we are going to be turning it, turning it over to Caleb and Molly, and they will be t talking about how we maintain and operate our system. Hi, my name is Molly, and Caleb and I will now be presenting to you about how we operate and maintain our hydroponic system. Me and Caleb will be talking to you about how we germinate our seeds, what to grow and how to grow, how we harvest, and the care and maintenance. Just a heads up, the germination process takes place completely separately from the rest of the hydroponic system. Now, what we do is we take the plant holders and we put two seeds in. The reason we put two seeds in is because any more and we risk overcrowding the plants. Any less and we risk not having full germination rates. After this, we take syringes and we carefully water the plant with them. Though you can use whatever you have on hand. After this, we place them in a grow lab. The point of the grow lab is to make sure that the bottom of the PVC pipe is always in contact with water. This way the soil can wick up the moisture so it's always wet. After this, we wait for the plants to germinate. After they've germinated, we put them into the hydroponic system. We do this by taking the test tube and inserting it um, from the lid from the bottom. We then take a rubber band and put it on top of the PVC pipe to make sure it doesn't fall through. After this, we have two jobs. The first job is to make sure that the lights are always hanging two to three inches above the plant. This way it has access to sunlight without becoming charred or crisped. The other job is to make sure that the bottom of the plant is touching the water. This way the roots can grow down into the water and get the nutrients it needs. Here's a picture of a fully grown lettuce plant and what it looks like underneath the lid. As you can see, the longer roots have grown down into the water and have sucked up the water, thus lowering the water level. This gives the plant access to the nutrient water solution. The shorter roots that can't reach the water will be sucking up oxygen for the plant. I will, now, I will now hand it over to Caleb, who will talk to you about what to grow and how to grow. Hi, I'm Caleb. I'm also going to be presenting in the how to use and operate a hydroponics system. I'll be explaining what to grow and how to grow, plus how to harvest. Now I'll get started. These are the different types of greens that can be grown in our hydroponic system. The reason why we only grow these greens is because we can't grow vegetable or root vegetables because those need a lot more soil than the Kratky method provides. If you want fruits such as tomatoes or strawberries, you're going to need LED lights because those get full spectrum light. As a plant grows and matures, it is important to raise the lights and not burn the plants. If the plant is in contact with the light constantly, the plant will burn and turn brown and crispy. To raise the lights, we have chains on top, on top of the lights that hang from hooks above. There are two sets of chains on both sides of the lights. To raise the light, we simply disconnect the chain from the hook, raise it, and reconnect it to a new or to another chain or yeah, another chain on the hook. To lower the lights, we do the exact opposite. And now I'm going to be explaining how to harvest. We pay a lot of attention to food safety. The first step of harvesting, which is the most important, is to wash our hands with soap and water. We always get at least two harvests from every plant. We only harvest the outer leaves and leave the middle leaves, which is about three to five leaves. To harvest, we gently take two fingers and find the stem of the outer leaf and just gently snap it off. It takes the, our plants about five weeks from germination for the lettuce plant to um, Sorry. It takes our plants about five weeks from germination for our lettuce plant to be harvested for the first time. Then we do it a second harvest about a week later. It's important not to harvest those inner leaves. Let those regrow so that the um, plant can get harvested over and over again. We only let it regrow two times because we found that it will get bitter over time. Here's what the plant should look like after harvest. You can see the inner leaves have not been harmed and the plant can regrow. I'm now going to hand it off back to Molly so she can explain the last part, which is care and maintenance.
I will now explain to you how we care and maintain our system. First, we remove the dirt, roots, plant, and burlap netting from the PVC pipe, but we're very careful to make sure that we keep the pipes and rubber band for future use. We then wash out the PVC pipe lid and tubs, but make sure to not use any chemical cleaners. This is because the chemical residue could remain and then harm the plants later on. We clean out the system every two harvests. After this, we reassemble the system just as we did when we first built it. A full cycle from germination to the care and maintenance takes about six to eight weeks. I will now hand it off to Locke and Adrian who will talk to you about how to put produce into your lunch. Hello, my name is Locke, and today my classmate Adrian and I will be talking about how to incorporate lettuce into your lunchroom. We focus on food safety when we prepare our lettuce. We always wash our hands and put on gloves before we handle anything. We also recommend that people with long hair keep their hair tied up. Harvesting and preparing the lettuce is all done by students. After the lettuce is harvested, we wash it in our school kitchen and we dry the lettuce with industrial salad spinners. Later, we refrigerate it in a clean garbage bag. Now, I will hand it over to Adrian, who will talk about how salad is made available in the lunchroom. Hello, my name is Adrian, and I will tell you about how salad is made available in our lunchroom. Up to this point, all the growing and harvesting um, has been done by students. In our lunchroom, the school staff person sets out lettuce, plastic bowls, tongs, and salad dressing so that anyone can serve themselves. One of the key reasons we grow our lettuce is so that anyone, regardless of what they have ordered for lunch, can have salad for free. We have found four main challenges, challenges on getting the salad into the lunch program. It takes us a lot of time to prepare and harvest the lettuce. We have struggled to find the time for students to harvest and prepare the lettuce. We also find it hard to, um, to have the right amount of lettuce at the time we need it. We don't know how much salad students will take and the amount of our harvest varies. An even bigger challenge we faced is communi communicating with other students about which days salad is available. We have no toppings other than salad dressing. Students have said that they would like the salad better with more toppings. Right now, we can't afford more toppings. In the future, we want to grow a variety of foods so that we can have more than just lettuce. Next, we will be hearing from Theo about benefits of a hydroponic system. Hi, my name is Theo, and I'm talking about the benefits we've noticed since installing a hydroponic system. A hydroponic system can be easily integrated into a farmer's school program and used in school lunches. So what is a farmer's school program? A farmer's school program is a uh, diverse and flexible program run by a school district or state. A farmer's school program entails a school receiving or purchasing produce from a local farm or business, or in our case, a hydroponic system. We are our own farmer, and categorizing it as a farm-to-school program allowed us to receive a farm-to-school grant to pay for the system. <clears throat> there are three main benefits to a hydroponic system. Uh, it builds healthy habits. Um, we've noticed that kids at our school are excited about eating food produced with our hydroponic system, and this has hopefully had a positive impact on how they eat at home. The produce we serve is much higher quality than average school lunches. Um, then there's also learning opportunities. Uh, we've been able to integrate our system into our science curriculum. Because of this, there have been a lot of valuable learning opportunities that we've been able to take advantage of. Of these uh, include, but are not limited to, learning how plants grow and what they need to do so, building the hydroponic system last year, teaching each year's class how to maintain the system, plus students learn the importance of sanitation and keeping food clean. Now I'll turn it over to Mrs. Cooley, who will uh, tell us more about uh, the learning opportunities that we've noticed. So we have another poll. 
And we'd like to hear from you. Are you currently working with the Farm to School program? So about 75% of our audience has voted so far. Give it a couple more seconds. 87%. So thanks to those who have voted, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So 36% of our audience are currently working with the Farm to School program. 61% are not and 4% are not sure. Okay, Ms. Cooley, and then it back to you. Thank you. I wanted to build on some of the benefits that Theo mentioned. Um, one of the greatest benefits that we've seen with this hydroponic system is the opportunities that it provides for learning. So I wanted to take a moment to tell you, give you some more details as to how exactly we embed this learning into our curriculum. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we really emphasize project-based learning. And so what we um, have done is um, made sure that this system is designed and built by students. As um, the kids mentioned earlier, last seventh and eighth graders started from scratch. They did all of the, they basically did a literature review. So this provided not only science content, but also ELA standards. We did close reads and um, actually read, you know, primary documents written by Kratky, and also invited experts into our um, classroom to really understand what we would need to make sure that our, our system was properly designed. Also, um, these the, the learning that we did are centered around Idaho State science standards. Um, these particularly meet a lot of the biology standards that we need geared for seventh grade. The way that I've organized the expedition is um, we we, call, we do this with the expedition called Farm to Food, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we started reading Omnivore's Dilemma. And so we asked the question, how do we feed ourselves now and into the future, and what is the omnivore's dilemma? And learned a lot about food systems, what do plants need? And so this, um, ex the uh, hydroponic system is actually giving us multiple final products and continuing work around the hydroponic system. So as I mentioned last year, students built a system. This year, um, the kids have learned a lot about this system and you're using it and creating this webinar. And then next year and even beyond that into the future, we anticipate expanding the system, also integrating LED lights, and then even expanding to aquaponics. So there's sort of a long-term plan here uh, to, uh, like I said, grow the system. I'm going to pass things over to Skylar right now who's going to wrap things up for us. Hi, I'm Skylar, and I will be wrapping up your webinar today. I'll start this off by briefly recapping the background. We explained what hydroponics is and that we used a cracky method and why we built one and you should do. To build our system, we used 10-gallon tubs on bookshelves. We cut PVC pipes into short pieces filled with soil to hold the plants. We used adjustable hanging fluorescent lights. And we were able to build the system for under $900. We germinate seeds outside of the system and transplant after one week. We grow just lettuce, but other leafy greens are possible. We get at least two harvests before emptying and cleaning the system. In order to get this lettuce into our lunch program, we pay attention to food and safety. We wash and spin the lettuce and then make it available in the lunchroom for anyone who wants salad. This means kids can have salad no matter whether they order hot lunch or bring a lunch from home. And of course, the staff can eat salad too. We struggle with some challenges. One is finding enough time, and the other is that we only have lettuce and dressing. Some students would like to have more variety, but we haven't expanded beyond just growing lettuce yet. The main benefits for us have been it's strengthened our farm to school program, it has health benefits, lots of kids are excited about having fresh lettuce in their lunch, and the system is a great learning tool. Thank you for listening. Now we have a poll.
So it would be helpful to us to know how you learned about our webinar today. So we're wondering if you heard about it through the Farm to School Network, the Expeditionary Learning Education Network, Facebook, email, or word of mouth. So while you're voting, I also want to remind you that you can type your questions that you have for the students or for Ms. Cooley into your question box. We're going to move into a question and answer period after this poll is completed. So about 80% of our audience has voted. We'll give it a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm going to move to close the poll and share the results. 29% of our participants today heard about this webinar from the Farm to School Network, 4% from the EL Education Network, 18% from Facebook, 15% from an email advertisement, and 21% word of mouth. Thank you for sharing, and we'll move on. Hi, my name is Prince. Thank you for listening today. Does anyone have questions? Please type them in now. We have answers. Thank you. This is Colette, and I'll be reading your questions today, and Ms. Cooley will either answer them or she'll have one of the students come up to answer the questions. So one question we have uh, starts with a comment, great job today. My question is, did you use your hyperponics system to teach younger students at your school about what, about what you were doing with this project? That is a good question. So and the answer to that is both yes and no. Uh, yes, and we would like to do a lot more. That's maybe a better way to answer it. So uh, last year when the kids first designed the system, what they did was uh, create a user manual that was without words but just pictures. And the idea behind that was that our kindergarten class, who, has, uh, also, who also works with um, gardening in their spring uh, semester, could then understand what was happening, how the hydroponic system works. Um, I would say we weren't entirely successful with really integrating that into um, use by the, the really young kids. Um, I would say that the main way that our younger kids have exposure to the system is that it's in our public foyer of the school and it's highly visible. Um, and so that is one thing we'd actually like to do a better job of doing is really integrating this um, down the school, but particularly with our kindergartners who um, also address this content. Thank you. We have another question. You showed the cost as being about $900. Can you go over what that includes and the yield of lettuce that you get? Uh, yes. So um, the biggest cost actually were those Sterlite tubs and the lights. Um, so we would initially, when we made our purchases, um, and as Theo and Kaya both mentioned, that we got this money initially through a farm to school grant. And um, in fact, Colette helped get that grant for our school. Um, so we, um, the, the plastic tubs were actually quite expensive and the, the lights. And then the other costs that we had were the PVC pipe. So I actually, to be honest, I don't have that breakdown right in front of me. But in terms of proportion, the greatest expense was the tubs, followed by the, the lights, and then followed by the miscellaneous items. And um, actually the black paint, too, you wouldn't think it, but the black paint, the spray paint, which we had to put multiple coats on those tubs to be able to really block out the light effectively. Um, those were our primary costs. And then we had incidental costs to be able to get all the hooks and straps and the system, which we, uh, I don't really want to use the word jerry-rig, but the reality is that we made this system work, as Joseph said, based on the materials that we had. And um, therefore, uh, 
as some people I know say, it's, it's a bit wabi-sabi so that uh, um, when you look at it, it definitely has, it's, it looks very nice, but it also has a bit of a homemade um, look to it. Um, so unfortunately, I guess I can't break the specific cost down for you, but I would say that we spent several hundred dollars on the tubs, um, well over a hundred dollars on the lights. We also buy a nutrient solution. Um, it's an organic um, uh, pro gold uh, nutrient solution, and that's actually quite expensive. One one gallon of that is about forty dollars. So um, that also adds into the cost. Um, and initially, too, we tried some different ways to germinate and grow the plants. We've now settled on soil. We find that that's the most effective. But we did initially purchase um, some material called oasis cubes, which are a non-soil substrate that you put into uh, your container. It's, it's, you know, you buy it in one inch or one and a half inch cubes, and then it has a little hole for your seed. So some of that was also um, in our cost. In terms of quantity, we have not been tracking that carefully, um, and that is something that we uh, actually can do. Last year when we were first harvesting, we did record the weights of um, our salad and how much we were harvesting, and unfortunately I didn't bring those numbers with me, but in general, I'll give you a description of quantity. We can harvest about a half a garbage bag full um, once we go into full mode. So the way that we have this set up is we've got it divided into shelves, and half of our system will um, produce about a full garbage bag each week. Um, and so the trick then is to make sure that that's staggered so that we have the right amounts when we need them. So. Um, and, and then, as uh, one of the kids mentioned, it's about a six to eight cycle between germination and uh, harvest. So the other trick is staggering in when we plant and being able to harvest in a staggered way. Thank you, Ms. Cooley. Could you also talk a little bit about the shelving units that you used that will hold these different growing beds? Sure. Um, I'm going to flip back through to actually show you some pictures. Um, you can see that. Uh, well, I guess I'll go to to that here, even though we've got some background. So these are bookshelves that were donated to our school. They're just very standard um, metal shelves. We took out all of the back brackets, and so with the um, when they're blank, there's a better picture in here, so I'm just going to scroll. You can see this is the frame for it. They're just adjustable shelves. And again, because they were donated, you can see here um, they, uh, they're about four foot lengths. And once we realized, initially we, we had looked at it, there was an organization in Pullman, and we relied on an expert um, there. And they had designed a, a system that was wood framed. And for us, it was it was going to take up a very large area. It was a flat table design. And in terms of construction for the wood and just the space, um, for us, we didn't have that much space. And we also were worried that we could find somebody with carpenter skills to help us. I'm going to scroll through here to get some different pictures of our, of our bookshelves. So um, again, these were donated. They're very standard. You can see the wood paneling there with metal frames. Um, they're very standard shelves, and once we realized there was this plethora in our storage area, um, we then looked for tubs that we could set on the shelves and settled on this tub because it so perfectly fit the length of the shelf. And we did some experiments and realized that we, we needed a tub about this height. Um, anything taller than this, you're basically wasting your nutrient solution, and for us, we the, the weight of the nutrient water was so great it would cause the edges of the container to bow out, but this is a very rigid plastic. Again, it's not too deep, and you sort of get maximum uh, depth for your roots and minimum amount of nutrient solution, so waste it just pretty low. Thank you. We have another question about what's used to test the pH in the water. 
we have not been testing the pH. When I first started uh, talking to experts last year and we had experts come into our room, um, that is one thing that was mentioned and we do have a pH kit that I fully anticipated we would need to use to troubleshoot our system. But the reality is that um, we have not had any problems with lettuce not growing or um, having problems and it's we, we've been using a black seeded Simpson lettuce and the taste has been fine. We haven't had any bitterness. So we have not bothered with testing the pH. We use just our standard city water and we have tested that in our science class before. So we know it's it's well buffered. It's it's neutral. It's got a pH of, you know, basically 6.9 and we have fairly hard water. Um, but we have not been doing any testing of the system. Thank you. Can you say a little bit more about the nutrients that have been the solution that you're using to feed the plants and how you add that to the water? It's very straightforward. Uh, we use a nutrient solution um, that's it's an organic solution and it's basically based on uh, bird droppings and fish meal. And um, it's, <laughs> I'm sorry on the spot here, my mind is drawing a blank, but it's, it's pro, uh, actually I'm sorry, I, I can't think of the name right now. Um, and we can post this later, but um, it's a it's an organic solution, and it's designed specifically for hydroponic systems. As I mentioned, it's a little bit expensive; it's about forty dollars per gallon. It was recommended to us by one of our experts, and um, it you know basically has your PKN nutrients, and it's worked out well for us. As you're answering questions, you're talking a lot about the experts that you've utilized. Could you kind of describe who your experts are? Yeah, absolutely. So um, our first one was, uh, Sue, her name is Sue Guyette, and she is in Pullman. Um, I don't have a picture of her in our pictures, but um, she, uh, she runs, she works with a food bank in Pullman, and she wanted to build a uh, system for their food bank. So we invited her into our classroom and uh, she told us she told us um, what uh, how, what she's basically done and then she looked over what we were thinking. We basically asked her to come in and look at our design and then she shared with us some of her trials and tribulations and so we built on um, what she had done with her system, which again was this wooden frame flat table type of thing. Um, and so we, we modified that based on what we read with um, Kratke's 2009 article. We used that basically as our research base. Another expert that we had is pictured here. His name's Brad Jekyll, and he works at Washington State University. He runs the organic farm um, program there. And so he came into our class as we were finalizing and the design and really going to get things going and helped us really understand more about lighting. We initially thought that we could use ambient light from our school and so we had, um, we were going to double the system and have one set of shelves plugged into fluorescent lighting and then another set just getting ambient light and he advised us not to do that. We haven't, we've been talking about maybe doing some experiments to try to set some of these in windows with just light. Our building uh, gets northern light and he said that uh, if we relied on that we probably have very spindly plants and they would not be very um, robust. So he steered us away from, like I said, trying to use ambient light. Um, also my students, they are more on the ball than I am. <laughs> they have reminded me that the name of the solution, the nutrient solution that we use is called ProBlend. Thank you. Do you have to use any herbicides or pesticides? None. And that, I know Kaya mentioned this, that it's some of the easiest farming you could do. Um, I know with Kratke, if you read his research, his article, he's from the University of um, Hawaii Hilo. He uh, talks about the problem with mosquitoes nesting in pots. So if you're using this system outdoors, uh, you might have a mosquito problem. But the reality is there's really no space or room for um, pests. And so no, we are, we're, we're using this indoors. And I would say the only pests we have are actually really good ones. And it's when people walk by and, you know, 
nibble on some lettuce before we harvest, but really, I'm, I'm joking, that's, that's never a problem. Um, so no, we, this is, we're basically producing organic lettuce. Thank you. Um, another question is, what additional crop would you most easily grow with your current system? Well, we've been hesitant so far to um, really expand the system um, just because of time. So we tried lettuce last year. Well, we, we realized how well lettuce worked. I wish I could give you a poundage uh, in terms of how much we've harvested. It's been, it's, it's been quite a few pounds. Um, and uh, we also tried spinach last year, which grew well. But in terms of the the amount of harvest, it was it was very low. And knowing that we wanted to maximize our production for greens into our lunch program, we just could not grow enough spinach to actually make it feasible to say, you know, okay, yeah, this is going to feed uh, enough for our salad program. Things that we'd like to move into next are really experimenting with. Um, some of the herbs because that could add flavor to our salad and we have not tried the arugula or kale but have been told that that could be um, quite effective we just haven't branched out with that yet uh, I am going to go back to a slide that Caleb showed you um, and I hope I won't make your head spin by moving through this so quickly. These are the greens that um, Kratke mentions can be grown. So we've got arugula, lettuce, kale, spinach, different herbs. Like I said, we'd like to try basil and chard. And we did get um, spinach, but like I said, just very few, just small, small uh, harvest compared to the plant for each plant. Great, thank you. So we have a couple of questions about time. One is, how long did it take to build your hydro hydroponic system? And then the other is, on a weekly basis, how much time is actually spent harvesting and maintaining the system? So as we mentioned, that this is one of our challenges. Um, last year, the kids were, we were working on a semester system. We've since switched to trimester. And I would say of our semester, you know, it took a lot of time to get all of the background knowledge to really understand um, basically enough of what plants need. And we, um, and, and then also I think because we spent time with omnivores dilemma, really getting inspired, inspired to think about food systems in general. But in terms of the work to design and build the system, it actually did not take that long. I would say it was um, about a three to four week process. Then, so the seventh and eighth graders last year finished building the system, and then this year's class, when they were sixth graders last year and they had me for science, this was not related specifically to our expedition work, but they became experts in um, growing and harvesting, and we learned a lot about food safety. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, I've actually forgotten that I, where I was going with this. Um, I'm going to have you repeat the question. Well, if you were to look at let's say how many minutes or hours it takes to maintain and harvest. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so on a per week basis, we spend um, about an hour to, an hour plus um, with the system. And um, in some ways that isn't that much of a, a, that isn't that much time. And what we have at our school is when we're not working with, if this group of kids and their expedition isn't harvesting the system, then um, we have another hour-long class and we have sort of an ethic of service in our school so it's possible then to get kids to um, you know sort of an ad lib basis to step up and perform the harvest but um, the other part from a teacher perspective is that um, you know in terms of supervision for the kids there's there's multiple moving parts so typically obviously we're in a classroom but then the system is out in a public um, hall in the in the school and yet where the washing and spinning and the serving where it ultimately goes into the fridge. All of those are different locations, and so supervision um, is sometimes a challenge. But to really answer the question, it's taking about an hour a week, and then on a daily basis, I'm sending kids out to check, well, at least I check the system daily to make sure our lights are in the right place, and send kids out periodically to um, adjust the lights. And in terms of the number of people that are part of this project? Uh, this year we have 11 
seventh graders who prepared the webinar. And then last year, we had a seventh and eighth grade combination class, and we had about 25 kids that were part of the design and build process. Great. Thank you. We have a couple of questions about where the idea for hydroponics came from and why are you using hydroponics versus aquaponics? So the idea for hydroponics, I will give credit to Colette. <laughs> she was really our inspiration and she is the one that connected me with, um, with her name is Sue Gayette from Pullman. And so here we had a local hydroponic producer and, and you know, felt like if somebody can do it nearby, we, we can too, and, and it was great to be able to ask her questions. Um, then the um, other part of that question, I'm sorry, my brain is... Why hydroponics instead of aquaponics? Yes, that is a great question. We actually hope to move into aquaponics. Um, but. The greatest reason we've settled on hydroponics to get started is just simply because it's manageable and it's much easier than aquaponics. So um, interestingly, these, these kids who gave the presentation today, last year as sixth graders were part of a grant writing process to get money to fund an aquaponics system. We didn't get funding for that, and if we had, maybe our webinar today would have been <laughs> on a different topic. But um, hydroponics is is so much easier than, um, I'm sorry, I think I said that correctly, Aqu hydroponics is so much easier than aquaponics. So the other challenge that I know we will face as we try to scale up and move into aquaponics is the fact that you definitely needed a, need a larger dedicated space. There is a lot more going on in terms of pumps. Then you have living organisms that you are trying to make sure that you don't inadvertently kill. Whereas with the hydroponic system, you've just got the lettuce growing. As Kaya said, there are no pumps. It's, it's, it's a completely passive system with the exception of needing to have your lights plugged in. And so for ease and to get started, this seemed like the only, um, just seemed the best way to go. Great. Do you have a sense of your electricity bill for running this system? I do not. Um, we are a we are in the state of Idaho, so in general our funding is quite low. And then because we're a public charter school, we do not receive additional funding through our you know local levies. So I do know that if it were a big increase, we we would have to you know we would plan around that. That I I know that um, our business manager would have come and said, wait, we've got too many lights plugged in. So um, it, it so far has been a negligible cost increase. Okay, thank you. And for the nutrient solution, is it something that you purchase locally? And if so, this is a question from Palouse, so someone would like to know that, or do you order it online? We have done both. The nearest place that I found I could get it uh, near us is uh, Lewiston. So I drove down to Lewiston and that's where I initially bought it and they were willing to you know let us get a tax exempt um, account going so that we wouldn't have to pay tax. We have also purchased it online um, although I've only been able to find it in small bottles but that was convenient because we were spending money for a grant and so we could do a bunch of purchasing all together. So done it both ways and um, uh, you know, this this makes me think, though, that I didn't really answer the question before of how we get this into the solution, it's, it's into the water. It's, it's, it is very straightforward. You know, this comes with instructions on the back in terms of a ratio. So you, it's got, you, you know, your concentration. So if you're using green, if you're watering for just green leafy vegetables, it's going to be different than something that you want to see flower or fruit. So we have, um, for us, it's, it's uh, I think, 20 milliliters per um, per gallon and so when we first set up our system we carefully measured um, the the capacity of our basins in order to get the water to the level that we needed it to be to to come to the base of the PVC pipe which is 10 gallons <clears throat> so as a result of that we when we first put the nutrient solution the fertilizer solution into the water we know that that's 10 gallons. We no, we no longer measure that every time. We just say, okay, we're filling it up to the full point. We have that marked, and we know that's 10 gallons. And so then I just 
use an Erlenmeyer flask to measure out 200 milliliters and basically dump that into each bucket and it takes very little time. Thank you. So our final question for today is, can a member of the public visit your program to learn more about how to set up a similar system? Absolutely. In fact, we've already given some tours just to show people. I know there's one science teacher in the area that came by to get a good look, and she's um, hoping to do something like this with her high school science class. So yes, our address is on our website, and um, I know that uh, if I go to the very end of our presentation, again, please don't let my fast movement let your head spin, but I'll make sure you can see our website which is right there, www.palouseprairieschool.org. If you are in our area, we are on at 1500 South Levick. There is a tour of our school that's available on March 11th. So if you go to the website or call the school, you'll be able to find out about touring our school. I also wanted to share from the audience that that some folks gave some positive feedback to our students today. Impressive job, excellent webinar, and thank you. And we do have one teacher who was interested in having this program be a case study for a greenhouse manual for teachers that she's writing. And so we will put her in contact with Ms. Cooley to follow up. We want to thank you for your time today, for joining us for the webinar. After the webinar closes, you'll have an opportunity to provide us some feedback with a short survey. We would love your taking the time to do that. The survey will launch automatically. We are also recording today's webinar, and it will be available on our school website at palouseprairieschool.org. Ms. Cooley, do you have any final words for our audience? No, but I really do appreciate, well, I guess I should say yes, I do. I want to thank everybody for um, tuning in today, and we certainly enjoyed being able to put this webinar together for everyone. It's very satisfying, um, and it's also been satisfying to use the system, so we hope we have inspired you. Um, I think one of the take-home messages um, should be that this kind of system is really simple to use. It is very flexible. There isn't... Um, a lot of high-tech technology. It's very forgiving, and so I guess in the words of some company, just do it. Colette, I'll pass it back to you. Great. This is the end of today's webinar. Again, please take our survey and look for the recording at palouseprairieschool.org. On that website, you will also find Ms. Cooley's email address, so contact us anytime. Thank you again, and have a great day.